located at 601 New Street, NEW, New Street, Beaufort, South Carolina, located downtown Beaufort, South Carolina, behind the infamous chocolate tree. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Sunday School Lesson number 11 for the week of December 13th in the year of our Lord, 2020. And we're taking it from the board's Sunday School book entitled, Call to Participate in a Promise. Call to Participate in a Promise. And the international lesson subject is called to be Emmanuel. Our lesson will come from Matthew, the first chapter, 18 through 25. First chapter, 18 through 25. This is actually a pickup from last Sunday's lesson that ended in Matthew 1, 17. Now, as a reminder, after this pandemic has passed, we invite you to join us for Sunday school from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and formal worship from 11, 15 a.m to 1 p.m. and until it's clear and clean, we'll be worshiping virtually and then we hopefully will come back into the house of God and worship face to face. But until that time, stay hunkered down and stay safe. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to consider us as home. The only prerequisite that we have is that Jesus Christ is acknowledged and is real in your life as your Lord and Savior. In furthering announcements, we would also like to invite you to come out to our church parsonage located next door to the, uh, to the church on New Street, NEW Street, New Street, starting at 1130 a.m. each Sunday for free food from our food bank that's supported by Second Helpings. The food is free of charge and is offered to anyone and everyone that comes out. You don't have to be a member of this church or any other church to receive this food as a Side note also, the food will not be handed out until 11.30, and that is to give everyone a chance to choose from these resources. The only thing that we ask uh, when you come out for the food is consider this, is that uh, we ask that you be masked and keep at least six feet from your neighbor in accordance with CDC guidelines. And I've iterated and reiterated and re-reiterated that this virus is very real. You know it's real in your heart of hearts. So please follow the directions of the workers distributing the food for your safety as well as theirs, okay? I do also want to thank all of our church members and friends. I'd be remiss if I didn't for their continued support of First African Baptist Church and that uh, your giving is sustaining us in the overhead of our legacy. And if you're not a member of FAB uh, uh, proper, but you desire to become a member of our giving legacy, feel free, you may send an offering to the First African Baptist Church, 601 New Street, Beaufort, South Carolina, 29906. And the address will also be given at the end of this Sunday School broadcast. <clears throat> now, I would also like to remind our congregation and friends that we will be celebrating our church's 156th anniversary on July 21st in the year of our Lord 20. 21. I know I said last time 157. It's actually the 156th uh, uh, church anniversary. We are asking all members and friends that can participate to offer $156 outside of your normal giving in keeping with our tradition of matching our church's birthday with our traditional giving each January. If you can, we really do appreciate it. And if you can't, we thank you for having in mind and desiring that you want to. We do really appreciate your prayers and well wishes for our success. So if you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. We're going to love you anyway. Amen. And what is our standard for success? It is that God be glorified, Jesus be honored, the Holy Spirit be obeyed, and God's people be edified. Now, having given the announcements, I ask that you turn in your Bibles or Sunday school books to Matthew, the first chapter, and let us read the verses 18 through 25, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. Okay, here we go. We're in this season uh, uh, to be merry and, and jolly. This is the season that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And here we go. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, uh, as his mother Mary was his spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, 
the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And he shall bring, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet uh, Isaiah in particular, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Key point. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And may God add a blessing to the hearers and understanders and the doers of his word. Let us pray, my beloved. Father, we thank you for one more time, one more day, one more year, one more month. We thank you for this time that you have given us to glorify you, Lord, and in glorifying you, we edify our own selves to show that we are your children and we choose to believe what you have said in front of us. We choose to believe that Jesus is Emmanuel. We choose to believe that you loved us from the foundation of the world. And we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so good all the time. There's none like you in heaven above or earth beneath. And we worship you and we adore you and we praise you, Lord God. And, and, and we thank you for your presence. And we thank you for condescending to us that you would allow us in your presence. Lord, I thank you. We thank you for who you are. Father, I acknowledge my sins and, 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 and I've sinned. Uh, 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 constantly, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I'm not where I, uh, I want to be, I'm not where I used to be, and, but Lord, please keep me all the way as I, you've already promised, and I know you have, I'm just agreeing with what you've already said. So Father, please not only forgive me, but forgive uh, our congregation and those that are tuning in now, forgive us of our sins as individuals, and not just as individuals only, but also collectively as a nation, Lord, for our nation has sinned and is sinning greatly against you. So please, Lord, be glorified. And at the same time, I know you're able, Lord, breathe out mercy. Have mercy one more time, because mercy, as Prince says, is what we stand in need of. Father, I ask as you forgive us that we don't be so selfish and, and, and just like an unrighteous ruler, Lord. We ask for a forgiving heart in each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to forsake the pain and the vengeance that comes in light of being offended, Lord, and help us to turn loose the right to hurt those that have hurt us, Lord God, and help us to forgive and show charity. Lord, please, I ask for wisdom, wisdom and knowledge of your word and of your ways, Lord God, and in that wisdom, obedience, Lord, give me clarity of tongue and love and kindness in my speech and understanding for me and the congregation, Lord. Father, I pray for those on the shut-in list, the prayer and shut-in list, Lord, not just this church only, but all the surrounding churches, Lord God, that pray for the ones that are shut down. And Lord, please, uh, I acknowledge your sovereignty and I give you the glory. Therefore, Lord, please hear our prayer, honor our prayer for thy name's sake, not for our glory, but for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. In the church of God, ha, ah, in the church of God said, amen. Amen and amen. Now, let's get into our lesson for the week where we will find out who it was that was called to participate in a promise. Here we go. Our Father, we
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for Here we go. Now, you know, I want to start off with just a small rabbit trail, if you don't mind. And uh, in saying that, I'll tell you a little story. I, several years ago, I went out to buy a brand new vehicle for my wife, and I wanted to buy a minivan. And I went into the uh, Ford dealer when the Ford dealer was over here in Beaufort, South Carolina. And uh, uh, when I walked in, I walked in and a, a salesman saw me and I had on sweat, sweatpants, sweat top tennis shoes, you know, uh, a little bit ungroomed and, and whatnot. And he looked me straight in my face and did not say a word, didn't ask if he could help me, didn't ask what I want or anything else. And unfortunately, he was uh, 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 someone that I thought would have at least come up and showed some type of customer service in that. But in any event, he just walked away. He looked at me, he saw me, and he walked away from me. And then another salesman came out. Uh, looked a little hungry, hungry after a sale and whatnot. And he saw me and he hurried and came over to me and asked, could he help me regardless of what I looked like? And I said, yes, sir, I want to buy a van. And I, I, uh, he looked at me and showed me at, at Astro. Y'all remember the Astro van you know, at, during that time? And he showed me the van and I bought it that then and that day, that, then and there on that day. And in buying it, I saw the other guy that had ignored me his mouth was open when he looked at me, not knowing that he had lost a commission and had lost a customer. And I'm saying that to say this, my beloved, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge people by what they look like all the time, because you could be in rejecting that person or those people, you could be rejecting your own blessing. Amen. Amen. So I, I said that in light of today's lesson also. Today's lesson focused on the unlikely hero, Joseph of Nazareth. And that's who we're going to talk about, Joseph of Nazareth. Joseph's background was unremarkable in a number of ways. I mean, he didn't have a whole lot going for him as far as what earthly people, as far as what people around him, even in his hometown, would say. First, his place of residence was Nazareth. Uh, you know, it's even stated in the Bible, the question is asked by the Pharisees, can, is there anything good uh, uh, that can come from Nazareth, not the Pharisees, but his own apostles, is there anything good that can come from Nazareth? It was a little low life place, a place where the soldiers would go and revel. It was a, a place not bigger than where I was uh, b uh, a born Dixie Lane Alley in Mississippi, and truly that's what it was, an alley filled with sharecroppers' houses, two-bedroom houses, uh, a dirt road. Uh, since then, they've torn it down, but it was a place of no remarkability. It was a tiny village, Nazareth was, well off the beaten path. And in Joseph's day, the town was so insignificant that it wasn't even mentioned in contemporary sources uh, uh, outside the Bible. Even the first century Jewish historian Josephus didn't include Nazareth in his list of Galilean villages uh, uh, subdued by uh, the Romans during the great Jewish revolt of AD 62, uh, I'm sorry, AD uh, 66 to 72. You know, the majority of the inhabitants of Nazareth would have worked as subsistence farmers 
or day laborers living uh, the peasant lifestyle typical of Rome's occupied provinces. And the second thing that made uh, uh, Joseph uh, so uh, uh, unremarkable, even within Nazareth, his social standing would, wouldn't have been anything really special. Its residents were dismissive of the adult Jesus calling him the carpenter's son. A reference to that reveals Joseph's trade, however. The Greek word often translated carpenter, we think of woodworkers and woodworkers only, but it's, it, it, it includes a whole range of occupations within building. So a carpenter could refer to a skilled woodworker, uh, a, a boutique craftsman, a construction worker, a, a stonemason or whatever, fits all under that heading of carpenter in that particular Greek word. So in the first century AD, Galilean laborers like Joseph was employed on major construction projects funded by the uh, Roman client King Herod Antipas, where they worked with stone, wood, and other materials to build roads and public buildings of such. Joseph may have spent most of his life working on new and elegant Roman colony uh, 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 at uh, Sepphoris, a three-mile walk north of Nazareth. And we saw where, when he went into Bethlehem, he stayed there for a number of years, applying his trade even there. You know, life was hard for poor laborers in that era, a fact that may explain why Joseph apparently didn't live to see Jesus' ministry. The average lifespan of an adult male during that time was no more than 45 to 48 years old. While he is mentioned as the father of the adult Jesus in, in John 6.42, uh, he last appears in the gospel in Luke 2.41-50, through 50, a story that took place when Jesus was 12 years old when him and Mary uh, was returning from Passover and went to look for Jesus and had to go back and find him. So, in ancient times, tradespeople like Joseph were not protected by labor laws or collective bargaining agreements uh, like what we have today. You know, as a result, they were subject to long work days, dangerous conditions, and the typically uh, high levels of taxation that Rome levied uh, on the subjects. It is highly unlikely that Joseph had received any kind of formal education and almost certainly that he could not read or write with any level of proficiency. Were it not for his association with Jesus, Joseph would have been lost to the pages of history. Nobody would have ever noticed his coming and going. But despite his humble origins, Joseph stood out among his peers in at least two uh, uh, respects. First, Joseph was a descendant of King David. You find that in the genealogy of what we studied last Sunday in Matthew 1, 1 through 16. And thus, a member, a member of Israel's royal line. He was a descendant of, a, of the king. This fact explains uh, why Joseph took his pregnant wife from Galilee to Bethlehem, because she was a descendant of King David also, as you find in the lineage of Luke. And in doing so, they both had to go there to pay their taxes and whatnot. Uh, uh, Joseph could have went alone, yes, but he was fulfilling scripture and prompted by the Holy Spirit that this child would be born in Bethlehem. Isn't that something? Okay, so Bethlehem, that's a Judean village about six miles from Jerusalem. They went there to register for the Roman tax census that's uh, recorded in Matthew 2 and also in Luke 2. Bethlehem was David's hometown, 1 Samuel 16 and 1. David was widely understood to be the ancestor of the coming Messiah who would rule Israel on David's restored throne. And you can find the story and ideology behind that in 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter, as well as Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. The second way Joseph stood out among his peers is what we're going to study about today. So let's get into the heart of the lesson. Let's first look at this unexpected pregnancy. Oh my goodness, isn't this something? Said so verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Huh. Now that is one of the biggest miracles and one to accept 
that was ever put before anybody, I can, as I would think. This verse summarizes a great deal of information that is discussed in detail over in Luke 1, 26 and 38. You know, following the Jewish customs of that day, Joseph was probably cons uh, considerably older than his bride-to-be, uh, uh, perhaps in his mid to late 20s, while she was in her mid to late teens. Uh, uh, the young ladies married very er early, as early sometimes as 13 years old. And before their wedding, Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that she would soon bear a child, a human impossibility in view of the fact that she was still a virgin. Luke 1.34 uh, plainly uh, states that she's a virgin. Matthew 1.18 picks up Mary's story after her return to Nazareth from a three-month visit with Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was her cousin, and Elizabeth was the bearer of John the Baptist, okay? So, and after she had visited three months there, and Elizabeth had uh, uh, finished uh, 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 with the birth of John the Baptist six months later, that's when Mary had Jesus. So that's why we know that John the Baptist was at least six months older than Jesus. You know, one can imagine how Joseph felt, though, when he discovered that his fiancée was pregnant. Man, can you imagine the, the, the destruction of his heart and of his feelings and of his mind? He loved Mary. And he's wondering, like any man would, how could she do something like that to me? I don't want to believe about some angel coming and telling her she's pregnant and she coming and tell me that the Holy Ghost got her pregnant. You better go find another dummy. Any explanation from her that this was a result uh, uh, not of unfaithfulness, but the power of the Holy Spirit was just mind boggling, just to say the least. Uh, it, it, no one would believe it. No one could have believed it at the time. But the, God has a way of fixing things, doesn't he? If he has a plan, then he has a way to accomplish those plans. God don't, don't have a contingency. He don't have a second plan or oh, by the way plan. What God says, he has already planned before the foundation of the world. And he's already seen it through because God is infinite from the beginning all the way to the end. Now, verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was not willing to make her a public example. In his mind, he was going to put her away privately because by all rights in Jewish customs, the Levitical custom, she should be taken out and stoned to death. And if they could find a man that got her pregnant, he was going to be stoned to death too. But we know that no man came into Mary. Uh, 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 it was the Holy Spirit. Mary and Joseph, her husband, they weren't yet married. And in the sense, they were not even living together in the same household. Now, ancient Jewish customs considered betrothed to be betrothed, uh, uh, to be legally bound to one another once their engagement had been announced and the dowry had been paid to the man. Joseph's presumed anger over the situation could have inclined him to demand the justice of the law Moses pres uh, 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 prescribed in Leviticus uh, 20th chapter, also in Deut Deuteronomy the 22nd chapter. Both state that those convicted of adultery are to be executed. So there's a lot on this girl's plate. At the very least, Joseph could have publicly terminated the engagement and kept the diary. That also would have brought disgrace to Mary and her family. Such a move would have been completely justified given what Joseph only knew at that point. And that's something about God's plan. When we are facing the plan of God and the action of God, God is sovereign. He doesn't have to, and more times than not, he don't tell us what his full plans are. We only know the plans of God, one, by studying the word of God who tells us what his plans, but his individual plans for us, we don't know what God's will is for our life until we look back and see what God has accomplished in our life. So quit trying to be a, a Christian mystics or quit trying to be a, a Christian palm readers and card readers and whatnot and quit this garbage of God told me to tell you this is going to happen to you. 
such foolishness, soothsaying. The same thing as Balaam. Balaam could legitimately tell some future things, but it still was unrighteous. It wasn't of God. And even though you do it in the church, it doesn't justify it as righteousness. So let's get back to the story. Joseph could have put her away. Joseph could have taken the diary. Joseph could have put her out there on Front Street and had her killed. But yet in this case, compassion won the day. And it is something, no matter what you think of an individual, no matter what you think of how a person should be, compassion should rule your heart. Because, but by the grace of God, there go I. And realizing that the child was not his, it wasn't his, Joseph decided to call off the engagement quietly. His attitude was reflected in the description that Joseph was a just man. His faithfulness to the law was appropriately matched by his desire to be merciful. Though many men would have uh, uh, qualified to be Jesus' adopted father based on being part of David's lineage during that time, Joseph's faith was of utmost importance for raising the Son of God. Joseph was clearly a man of remarkable faith and, he did, here's that word again, compassion. These traits come to the forefront of today's passage in our study and are critical to Matthew's larger account of the circumstances of Jesus' birth and early childhood. Verse 20, here we go. But while he thought on these things, Joseph Behold, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel again, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Matthew's account of the events leading to Jesus' birth is filled with dreams. Amen. So many along the way had dreams. They were dreamers. No fewer than five times in five, in characters received divine revelation through dreams that significantly impacted the course of events. Now keep in mind, you say, you see there, that proves that God still worked through us in dreams. No, it does not. Because if you read and study last week's lesson, it said God who at sundry times died, spoke to the prophets in different manners. And that's talking about in dreams and visions. But in this day right now, he speak to us through Jesus Christ in his completed word that is the Holy Spirit. Bible. That's how God speaks to us now. And in your Christian walk, the walk should be living the life that God would have you to live, doing what God would have you to do, enjoying what you desire to enjoy within the confines of Christianity. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, is it God's will that this person is my husband? Is it God's will that I buy that car as God will that I, I, I purchase that home. All of these things are temporal. And if you are doing it in accordance to God's word, as far as marriage, let's look at marriage. If you are not unequally yoked and you love the person, marry them. But listen to what the scripture says. Don't be unequally yoked. If you want that car, you want that house and without going into deep debt or, or uh, you can afford it and God has blessed you to, uh, to have it, buy it. There's no God's will in this. This is what I want, and he's going to allow me to do it. I'm going to do it. It all fits in the confine of living an everyday Christian life. Get away from the mysticism and use your mind and be real in the sight of God and be real in the mirror. Amen. Just because you can utter some ecstatic language, just because you can fake a lie about healing people or, 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 or believe some of the old stuff about folks raising folks from the dead. These are lies. These are lies. Don't believe the lie. Okay? These dreams were before the canon of scripture was sealed. Before Revelations was the last book of the Bible. Okay? So one of these dreams, however, though, and they were still, remember, during this time, even though this is in Matthew and Luke, they are still living in Old Testament times because Jesus Christ has not been crucified yet. 
And once he is crucified and resurrected, that begins the real New Testament that's in his blood because the new covenant had to be written in Christ's blood. One of these dreams, now let's talk about the dreams, were given to the wise men who warned them not to return to the treacherous King Herod, told them to go another way. Uh, uh, uh. And that advice probably saved their lives. Amen. Uh, four other dreams were all communications to Joseph calculated uh, uh, to empower him to protect Mary and Jesus from harm. And you can find uh, uh, other reasons of uh, the other dreams that God gave Joseph in the second chapter, in the 13th verse, and in the 19th through the 20th verse, and in the 22nd verse. You'll find all that in Matthew. You'll find what God gave Joseph dreams and directing his path. Now, while anyone would be awed by even one experience, Joseph in particular must have been surprised by these revelatory dreams. Now, in the Old Testament, very few people learned about God's plan and dreams. They included Abraham, you find that in Genesis, in Genesis. Jacob had dreams, Genesis 28th chapter. Joseph, who bears the name of Joseph here, uh, uh, technical jacket, uh, 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 Isaac's son, uh, uh, Jacob's son, brother, uh, uh, 37th chapter. And then Solomon had dreams in 1 Kings, the third chapter. And Daniel had dreams in Daniel, the seventh chapter. Undoubtedly, there have been nothing in Joseph's life to this point to suggest that he would be numbered with the select group. And a lot of times you may feel that you're beyond God's use and God has no use. Trust me, there's not a human being born that God doesn't have a purpose for to glorify himself in. I don't care who you are. And one thing I want to put on the table and then sweep it off is that there is not one child that has ever been born that is a mistake. God gives life and God takes life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Verse 20, second part. Saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And, and, and what Joseph shared with most others uh, who experienced revelatory dreams in the Bible was faithfulness to God. As God revealed things to them, they became faithful in these things. And that brings about the question that we have to ask ourselves. As we learn to do better, do we do better? As we learn God's word, do we walk that in? Or are we in so much in love with ourselves that we selfishly hold on to hateful thoughts towards one another? Do we selfishly hold on to our uh, 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 sustenance from helping somebody else? Do we hold on uh, because we feel we've been hurt so bad that we won't love one another? What we learned from Joseph's first dream was more significant than anything God had ever revealed to anyone before in history. Mary's pregnancy was of a supernatural origin. Hmm. Not the result of sin. This was a supernatural thing. Had not been done before, never to be done afterwards. Now, so we, we don't even think about that excuse. Amen? Never to be done uh, again. Joseph was called to partner with God in caring for both her and her baby in order for God's eternal purposes to be fulfilled. And, and that goes back to saying that God is sovereign. God does anything, however, in whichever way he wants. But God also chooses to use mankind to carry out those sovereign purposes. That makes us also not only disciples of Christ, but also responsible for doing God's work also. And that's also what makes sinners responsible for their sin. The phrase of the Holy Ghost parallels the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary in Luke 135. Luke underscores the implication of the virgin birth by noting that Jesus having no biological father would be son of the highest, Luke 132. This title has less to do with the manner 
of his conception and more to do with Christ's rights and authority as the sole heir of everything that belongs to his divine father. Christ had the right to, amen? So, verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, this is what the angel is saying, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Ancient names were often symbolic, associating a person with an event or identifying an important attribute about that person. People's names at that time had meaning behind their character, their personality, and their purposes. You know, following a similar pattern, Jesus is the Greek version of the common Hebrew name Joshua, which means God saves. Joseph perhaps thought of uh, 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 the biblical hero Joshua, whom God used to lead Israel uh, uh, into the promised land. Joseph's adopted son, Jesus, and that is the truth of the matter, his adopted son, Jesus, would not save his people from political oppression. It had nothing to do with the Roman Empire conquering. It had nothing to do with Herod sitting on the throne. It had nothing to do with uh, Pilate's raising and falling. It had nothing to do with the taxation system of trying to overthrow it. He had nothing to do with saving the people from uh, being uh, uh, occupied by Rome. He had nothing to do with the political oppression at that time. He could care less. But instead, he would save them from their sins because the time that we live now in, on this side of the grave is but a twinkling in our eye, uh, is nothing but a breath, it's nothing but a blade of grass that has sprung up to die to be cut down on this side of the grave. But when we talk to individuals and they are converted and they are saved and the Holy Spirit harvests them, then we are talking about eternity never to end. So what we do for, only what we do for eternity will last. Amen? Yes, we are to vote. Yes, we are to have opinions, especially in our democracy. Yes, we are to have to do with the goings on and the happenings of the laws and stuff around. But don't depend on any man, any president, any congressman, any senator, anybody, any preacher to determine your eternal salvation. Our salvation is determined by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Amen? Amen. So, in order for Jesus to save people later, as he got older, Joseph needed to protect Jesus' right then by caring for Mary. He saved the baby by caring for the wife. Amen? Amen. And, you know, just a little side note. You know how I am about these side notes. If you want a household with children that loves you, men, love the wife. And when the child sees the husband and wife loving each other, then their minds and their hearts are relieved and they sleep peacefully. They learn better. They do better. Uh, I'm here to tell you, if you really want to love your family, spouses love each other. If you really want a great family, spouses love God. Amen? And demonstrate that before your children. Verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet that said, uh, saying, uh, saying, prophet saying. Matthew paused the story to remind us, his readers, of a second way in which the significance of Christ's birth and mission was revealed to the world. The ancient and public testimony of the Hebrew scriptures, the prophet in view here, talking about Isaiah, Matthew quotes or makes reference to prophetic texts several other times in his account of Jesus' birth. But these citations combined with Jesus' genealogy work together to demonstrate that the circumstances of the Messiah's birth, although not what most Jews anticipated, were nevertheless consistent with what God had promised. They were expecting a king to come riding on a horse. They were expecting a king to come overthrow the Roman government. They were expecting a, a high political person to usher in the new Jerusalem, the new Israel. But this 
savior here to save this uh, man from the sins uh, uh, of the world, to save the world from sin, was born as a, in a manger, a lowly person, but yet he was still king of king and lord of lords. Amen. So, put another way, while many Jews and pagan religious experts like the wise man would have expected the king of the Jews to be born in a royal palace, Matthew shows from scripture that Jesus' humble origins were actually proof of his messianic identity. Verse 23, Behold, look, pay attention, a virgin shall be with child. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? A virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14 was delivered during a particularly dark period in Israel's history. Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC around uh, 200 years after the split between the northern and southern tribes following the death of Solomon. You know, sometime in around 740 BC, the northern kingdom Israel allied with Syria. And remember, the northern king kingdom and the southern kingdom, these are brothers. They are the same tribe of the same blood, the same people, but there had come a civil a civil, a, a civil, civil division. You had the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And they had lines of demarcation when they had separated. Now, Israel of the north wanted uh, the southern tribes to join them to go to war against Assyria. And they said no. So what did the northern tribe of Israel do? They joined up with Syria, not Assyria. They joined up with Syria and went to fight against their own brothers in the south. That's like us joining a, a, a complete stranger against our own family. And that's, but it happens, doesn't it? During the ensuing siege of Jerusalem, they went to kill and subject uh, uh, their brothers into bondage. So when Israel, the northern kingdoms, went uh, to place siege on Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, Isaiah met with the Judean king Ahaz. Now Ahaz was an evil king. But God's desire to save his people was above the carnal king's uh, uh, personality and conduct. So uh, Isaiah went to King Ahaz to encourage him, promising that God would overthrow his enemy. And Isaiah even invited him to ask for a divine sign, whatever he wanted, that victory would come. You find that in Isaiah 7 chapter. And, and here's Ahaz. As unrighteous as he was, like a lot of folks, as unrighteous as they are, they still want to be seen as people of high morals. They, they feign righteousness. You know how this fake piety is uh, when folks say, you know, highly favored and all this other stuff and still live like hell. So here's Ahaz. He refused the sign saying that he did not want to test God. And what he had, in fact, uh, he didn't want to listen to Isaiah because in his feeble little mind, he already had a plan of action. In fact, he had decided to seek protection from an earthly ally. He had already sent ambassadors to negotiate with the Assyrian king. And Assyria was deadly. These guys, I mean, they had packs of skull stacked up out in front of their palaces and whatnot. These were bloodthirsty people and they would annihilate uh, nations by intermarriage and whatnot. And that's why you had Northern Israel uh, and the Assyrian people and other captive people marry them and they became known as Samaritans and the Southern people hated the Samaritans. That's another story. But that's how things happen in the course of life. People hate you for no reason. People hate you uh, for circumstances in your life that you have no control over. People don't need a reason to hate. They just hate just because we are of the sin and the lineage of Adam. So uh, uh, Ahaz sent King uh, 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 Tiglath-Pheleser uh, 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 and padded it with large quantities of gold and silver taken from the temple sent message uh, to, to the king of Assyria. And Assyria responded 
gladly by attacking and subjugating Israel. Israel wanted to take, uh, take their brothers in the south in bondage, and God turned that thing around uh, 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 in, in his providence and show uh, when Assyria came and took Syria and Israel into captivity. Isn't that something? As a gesture of thanks, the king of Judah, and here's the sinful thing that Ahaz did, the king, the king of Judah built an altar in the temple, and he patterned this altar after one he had seen in the Assyrian capital, Damascus. You find that story in 2 Kings 16th chapter. While these actions seemed politically expedient at the time, Isaiah recognized the faithlessness of this strategy. He responded by offering the king of Judah a sign quite different from one uh, the wicked king might have requested as evidence that God himself would deliver Judah from its enemies, a child by the name of Emmanuel, God with us, was to be born. Before a certain child reached age 12 or 13, the nations of which the king was so terrified of would cease to exist. Isn't that something? After the Assyrians defeated those nations, they would get theirs at the hands of the Babylonians. And it was the Babylonians who destroyed tiny Judah in 586 BC under uh, Nebuchadnezzar. It's unclear now whether Isaiah himself saw this prophecy about Emmanuel partially fulfilled through the birth of his own son the following year. That, that story is in Isaiah 8. Uh, uh, 1 through 10. Matthew definitely saw the fullest significance of Isaiah's words in the birth of Jesus. But in the long term, this sign referred to the coming of the Christ, the ultimate Emmanuel, the ultimate God with us. The Bible emphasizes the importance of God being with his people. This is more than just a figure of speech. In Jesus, it was a fact. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, according to John 1.14. Isaiah's more detailed promises in Isaiah 9 were also fulfilled. Through Jesus' ministry, God would indeed be with his people in an unprecedented way. Verse 24, then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Any doubts Joseph may have had were settled by the dream that he had. And you know, sometimes you can wonder if a dream is real or not, but I'm here to tell you, when God gives you a dream, it is very real, amen? And if he wants to speak to you, he'll speak to you directly for the most part. Consistent with his faithful character, he did not question what God showed him or hesitate to act in, in, in obedience to God. Instead, he immediately proceeded with the marriage. And it's not difficult to imagine that Joseph moved the date of the wedding up to ensure that Mary would be cared for during her pregnancy. Isn't it something? Uh, Joseph truly was a just man. Verse 25, last verse. And knew her not. This is the key to the virginity of Mary. This is the key to the miraculous birth of Jesus' conception uh, and birth. This is uh, 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 vital to know that there, even though Jesus was born in the likeness of sinful flesh, he did not and could not and would not sin while in the flesh. Amen. And he did not inherit the sin of Adam because he was born of the Holy Spirit. If Joseph had begotten Jesus through Mary, then the bloodline of the lineage of Adam and sin would have been in Jesus' veins. But because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit through a virgin birth of Mary, because the women don't carry down the sin uh, uh, heritage like the man do, the man passes on the sin. Amen. And unfortunately, passes on to men and women. So, and here's verse 25. He knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph not only obeyed God's instruction.
to take Mary as his wife, but also went a step further by not consummating the marriage until Jesus had been born. God had not told him to do this, and the law of Moses did not forbid sex during pregnancy, so Joseph's choice of abstinence most likely reflected his own sense of the gravity of the situation. In other words, it started with the Holy Spirit. It's going to end with the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's not going to be any ambiguity, and there will be no doubt whatsoever that this thing that was born was of the Holy Spirit. This point is stressed to ensure that there can be no confusion about Jesus's paternity. Mary had not been sexually active at any point before or during her miraculous pregnancy, and that is very important to salvation. Following the birth of Jesus, the couple had a normal married life, and this is evident from the fact that Jesus had at least four brothers and three sisters. You find that in Matthew 13, 55 through 56, and Mark 6 and 3. Two of his half-brothers eventually became leaders in the church. They wrote the two epistles in our New Testament that bears their name, and that's James and Jude. And his, it, it, what is this telling us, though? Here's what it's telling us. Matthew's account of Jesus' birth is a classic, and I want you to remember this, yes, you story. This is a yes, you story. And I'm telling everybody that's listening to include myself looking in the mirror. Yes, you. Throughout the Bible, we see people who were surprised when God called them to do something and who responded to uh, the call with a who me. And, and, and that is something when God calls us to preach who me. And even other people, when God saves somebody that's notor notorious, it comes out of the mouth. Who them? Consider Abraham and Sarah in Genesis. Consider Moses in Exodus, Isaiah in Isaiah, Jeremiah in Jeremiah, and Peter even in Luke 5, 1 through 10. All these people went on to play key roles in the story of salvation. But first they had to get over the who me barrier, the who me question. Joseph and Mary lived out the classic who me, just like some of us are today. I never would have thought that I would be a pastor of a church when I was coming up. So when the time for when God called me to pastor and put me here, my question was, who me? And the answer from God is yes, you. Yes, you. The you, who me, yes, you storyline in a unique way described Joseph and Mary. Neither was particularly outstanding as the world judges people to be outstanding. But when called, they did what they were asked. And that's the key, my beloved. When God calls and you ask who me, and he says, yes, you, it would behoove you to obey. How tragic when God has a task but finds no one to respond. And when we say who me, God typically responds with, yes, you. And remember, whoever God sends, God equips and God qualifies. Father, help us to remember what it means that Jesus was born, God with us. Let your presence give us the confidence to be obedient whenever you call us. In Jesus' name we pray this. The Church of God said, Amen. Amen and amen. And remember this, faithful people trust God, especially in extraordinary circumstances. So until next time, my beloved, the vet quorum Deo, live on the face of